our world is currently facing unprecedented challenges, such as war and energy shortage. Yet we must not lose sight of the long-term developments like climate change. The chemical and plastics industry is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, but we are also part of the solution. With innovative products to foster a truly sustainable world and cope with global challenges. Take urbanization. By 2050, more than two-thirds of the world population will live in cities. This increases the need for constructing new energy-efficient buildings and refitting old ones. They need to be best insulated against heat and cold. Polyurethane rigid foam is the material of choice for this. Other plastics are indispensable when it comes to foster sustainable mobility. Electric vehicles need to be as light as possible and a dense network of charging systems must be installed. Here the high-performance plastic polycarbonate comes into play. The materials produced and used must be kept in the loop, but there is still a lot to do. We need circular economy to be the new global guiding principle for companies. I think that there are many barriers and challenges to circular economy. One of the challenges is that we have this entrenched global supply chain. And thinking about how to move from this entrenched global supply chain to one that's maybe more decentralized, um, I think is a huge challenge. The other challenge again is how we do design is so traditional and passed down for many, many years. And so rethinking innovation and design, I think takes talented and creative scholars. We need plastics, but we need them to be utmost sustainable, climate neutral and circular. Covestro is committed to become fully circular. Since 2020, we follow this vision. In 2022, we announced another concrete measure, climate neutrality by 2035 for scope one and two. For this, collaboration with academia and science is key. One of the reasons why I'm very much interested in circular economy is that we need pragmatic, actionable solutions for climate change. And many of the solutions that have come out in the past are too incremental. And I think that a circular economy can lead to catalytic changes that ultimately address um, climate change. There is no planet B. We need to work together to fight the triple crisis, climate change, resource depletion, and environmental destruction. I think our vision for the future is where we all companies collaborate, particularly in the chemical and plastic industry, to make this reach a critical mass that are showing how we are all together moving the needle and how this industry is dramatically reducing the emissions and contributing to a much more safer future for our children. That requires a collaboration between the companies, as we were mentioning before, but also from the legislators, from other parts of the value chain, from the different players at the global scale. So now we are looking forward to crafting connections with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Covestra Arena here at K2022. And I also want to welcome everyone who is watching us online through our various digital channels. Thank you for joining us. And I would like to thank you for joining us today as we start into discussing how to transition to a circular economy and climate neutrality. My name is Martin Kloss, and I'm really looking forward to all the discussion that we'll have on this stage. This is a platform where we want to share the knowledge, the perspectives, as well as the solu solutions. And as you just heard, we want to craft connections with you. So I want to start by connecting you with Covestro's CEO. Please welcome Markus Steilemann. Thanks, Martin. A very good morning. And also a very warm welcome to the leading and largest fair on plastics, the K2022. It is exactly at the right time that we're starting here. And it is a pleasure that all of you are here and that we can talk about one of the materials that will help us to solve many of the challenges that are lying ahead of us. So what am I talking about? 
We have a world that is full of challenges, a world that is full of crisis these days, where we're lacking sometimes positive messages. And it's the world also where we have deepened trenches between different parties, between different players on the geopolitical scene, but also about different views about how we can develop a joint future. And that why it is more important than ever that we come together here at this world leading fair. Because plastics can change the world for the better. We do acknowledge that there's many challenges around plastics, but we also do even more acknowledge that plastics will be, can be, and are already today part of the solution. Therefore, I personally believe plastics is the material of the 21st century. In this sense, it is therefore important that we acknowledge it is a must for a smart, for a fair, for a just, and also for a sustainable future. So let me elaborate a little bit what I'm talking about, how we can solve many of those challenges. Key here in this context, it is all about collaboration. We need like-minded people. We need debate. We need different perspectives. We need ingenious people who work on the solutions, who find solutions to overcome the challenges that we are facing today. For example, we need agile coalitions. That means superior structures in a sense compared to large corporations which try to incorporate everything. What we need is also that we craft connections. And that's why the KFAR has this year the very strong motto, crafting connections with you. And Covestro is at the center of crafting connections with you. If we're talking about tackling challenges, it is that you will see here also, not only here, but specifically here at our booth, how we have jointly demonstrated how we can achieve things. That means making the world a better place. We're working on long-term challenges. For example, fighting the climate change, making sure that we deal with the limited availability of resources and with, that we do jointly something against continue to polluting the one planet that we have. In this context, it is also important that we look how will people live in the future. For example, a good and sustainable life in ever larger cities. Because by 2050, we expect that about 10 billion people will live on this planet, and they're of 65% in cities. And that's why it is so important that we think about it. And also, mobility in harmony with the environment and with our health. So just come around. Look here at the booth, look at the entire fair, look at all the exhibitors, and engage in conversations. Because we have a wide range of activities that are waiting for you, we would like you to take a tour here at our booth in the entire Hall 6, but also the entire fair. And we want to make sure that you also understand how digitalization, next to the materials that are presented here, will play a major role in solving many of the challenges that we're currently facing. A big thanks in that context goes to the entire teams, goes to all the individuals which have made this possible. Not only the exhibits, but also the research, the development, the endless and myriads of interactions that we have with consumers, with suppliers, with our customers to really come to those brilliant ideas and brilliant solutions. And therefore, I'm also sure that you as visitors will really appreciate that, that you can look at all these exhibits here. So what are the focus topics here at our booth? It's about crafty, crafting electrification that means jointly advancing renewable energy, one of the key topics of our times. Make transportation as well as buildings climate neutral, crafting sustainable living, referring back to life in cities and sustainable cities, which combine then energy efficiency as well as comfort, for example, at home. It is all about transforming urban spaces into a sustainable oasis. And last but not least, crafting smart designs. That means creating and making full use of the digital power that we have. An overarching topic in this context, and particularly important for the chemical industry, and even more so for the plastics industry, is the circular economy. That concept is the meta topic for our industry. It meets and it is a matter that is very close to my heart and that since many years. That's why I'm standing here, why I stood here and will stand here 
to provide you insights into this concept. Covestro has geared itself fully towards circular economy. It is our vision to become fully circular. We're looking, for example, for alternative raw materials, green carbon, people would sometimes call it. It could be biomass. It could be, for example, recycled plastics. But it could also be just waste that we're using to produce very innovative materials. We need to look into different technologies, for example, innovative recycling technologies. And we need a really large and very fair share of renewable energy to make our economy, our industry, more sustainable and fully circular. And that's why it is also so important that we have set ourselves a target to become climate neutral by 2035, brackets for scope one and scope two. And we're still working on scope three also to set ourselves here a very ambitious target latest by next year. Another guiding principle is that we need a system change. And that is the word that you find everywhere, that people talk about we need to fundamentally change something, the way how we look at our economy, the well, way how we look at uh, growth, the way also how we look at wealth. And therefore, circular economy is one of the key building blocks to live and accept to live within the planetary boundaries that we are having. And therefore, it is key to protect the climate, to protect our resources, but also rebuild our economy. And therefore, we need to stop the model of extracting, producing, consuming, and then finally throwing away. But we need to start with the concept of new forms of prosperity, consumption, and by that, satisfaction. You can live a satisfactory life without continuing with the old way how we did and lived with the economy so far. And therefore, it is a great pleasure to me that we now have a very, very good panel with very distinctive people. And therefore, I would like to bring this down from a rather philosophical level and philosophical, let's say, level of questions that need to be addressed down to a very pragmatic level where we can talk about how will solutions look like, where we can talk about how there is a positive also twist to everything that currently heavily weighs on our minds and on our shoulders. And therefore, I'm looking very much forward that I talk with guests from society, business, as well as academia. And therefore, I also expect a clear impetus from this discussion for the major transformation that lies ahead of society, of the chemical industry, and also the plastics industry. And let me be absolutely clear. What I'm talking about is not an utopia. It is reality. We have the technologies, we know exactly what to do, and now we need to switch from analyzing and debating into just do it. And that's why it is so important that we can, and we have a truly sustainable world at our fingertips. We just need to grab it. We just need to make it real. We just need to make sure that we move full steam ahead. That needs determination, it needs courage, and it needs stamina. So having thought about this, the ideas and technologies that are at hand, the right materials, climate neutral, as well as circular plastics, and the right people are here right now, and therefore we will start. And that's why I want to really make use of the technology, the materials, and the people to tackle the situation. Let's go. And that's why I'm now looking very much forward, jointly with Martin Kloss, to welcome our panel. Thank you very much, and talk to you later. Thank you, Marcus. And yeah, you said, let's not rest in utopia. Let's make it a reality. So we have a wonderful panel. Thank you for the segue. Have a seat, please. And I'd like to invite the rest of our panel to come to the stage and take their seats. And I will just start by diving right into it. All right, welcome everyone. Please take your seats and then I'll start us into the discussion. Now, Marcus Schallemann just gave us a lot of information and shared a little bit of Covestra's perspective. And we all know that the search for solutions really to protect the environment, to conserve energy, to transition to renewable energies is one of the biggest, if not the biggest task for the coming decades that we all face. And if we want to find the solutions to really avert a climate catastrophe, we need 
politics, business, and society to join forces, to really work hand in hand. It's not optional, we have to do that. So finding these solutions is crucial, and making them a reality is so important. And that's what all of our panelists today have in common. They're working on making it a reality, whether it's the industry, think tanks, politics, and we are so privileged and really happy to have them here on this stage. And we want to talk about a lot of things. So hopefully, <laughs> we'll not run out of time. And um, we have reserved time for your questions um, at the end and also for your questions online. So please um, think about the questions, write them down, or tell us uh, through our digital channels. So let me introduce the, cha the panel first. We'll start with the younger generation, Theresa Oberhauser. She is the global coordinator of the youth constituency of UNEP, engaging more than 400 global youth organizations via the major group system of UNEP. In her professional life, she also works with uh, Circle Ice in the Netherlands on making supply chains more transparent and sustainable. Hi, Teresa. Good to have you. Thank you. All right. And this is your applause. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sitting next to her is Sophie Hermann. She is a partner with Systemic Circular Materials Platform. Previously, she worked with McKinsey, the World Bank, and led the Center of Excellence for Sustainability, advising on innovation through sustainability management, sustainable supply chains, and circular economy. So a real expert who will help us with the discussion today. Hello, Sophie. Good to have you. And then we have Markus Kreber. He has been CEO of RWE, RWE since May 2021. The company is the world's number two in offshore wind power and Europe's third largest in renewable energy. So uh, one of the big players, and we're privileged to have him. Markus, good to have you. And I do not have to introduce him again. Um, we're very happy that he has taken the time to be on this panel as well. Markus Stadelmann, CEO of Covestro. Good night. Hello, Markus, once again. Thanks. So I want to start with something I call level the playing field, to just talk about the status quo. Where do we stand? And we all know from science, <coughs> well, they've done studies, so keeping the status quo will result in a temperature rise of four degrees by 2050, with catastrophic consequences for the planet, and most of all, us, humanity. So. Are we doing enough? Are we investing enough? Um, we also have a question from a professor of, of the Pittsburgh University, Professor Bielek, I've seen her in the film. So I want to start with that video and then take the question from there. So from all the studies that I have read, it's more expensive to not address issues related to climate change than to address issues related to climate change. So I would pose that question. If it's more expensive to not address issues of climate change, why are we not as a society investing more? This is kind of the obvious question, but I want to go into a little more detail. Uh, Teresa, you sort of represent the younger generation. You're politically active. You talk to a lot of young people. And from your perspective, and you also have this international perspective as well, um, what do you think? Why are we not investing more? Um, the young generation, we all know, will be the most affected of all this. Um, and we hear them voicing their concerns more and more. They go to the streets. They are politically active. But our economy, politics, society, are we all doing enough, investing enough, whether it's money, time, or energy, really, to yeah. tackle this crisis? Um, the easy answer is no, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure we all agree here uh -huh. on the panel on that fact. No, I mean, if we look uh, at the young people, I mean, um, I'm engaging with more than 400 youth organizations in the actual negotiation process on policies in United Nations environment, and uh, what we see is it is not enough. We're not advancing enough, and it causes more and more frustration among young people because, as we've just seen in, in the video, it is extremely scary and frustrating seeing all of these effects on our day-to-day -day life and the, the difficulties that we will be facing. I mean, we have some, some difficulties right now and we see more and more effects of, of climate change, for example, that we are not addressing um, well enough. And um, 
there's more to come and young people see you know a uh, COVID crisis they see a war in Ukraine they, and and a lot of situations a lot of excuses and, and difficulties in terms of why we can currently not focus on the topic but we need to need to really work on on those issues more and um, also allow for young people to really engage in those processes more to really be at the decision making table because it's their future what is decided upon and their resources and their difficulties mm -hmm. Marcus. Yeah, I would like to add the perspective of the global energy system. We think we are currently in an energy crisis here in Europe because of the Russian aggression and the consequences. But the truth is we would have run into a global energy crisis anyhow. Because when you look at the investments in the global energy system over the last decade, it has actually plateaued. Mm -hmm. And now you need to understand two things. First of all, given the growing population, the demand for energy is actually increasing globally. And when you switch from a fossil system to renewable system, you need significant more investment because in wind and solar, all the cost of the system are upfront in the, in the capital expenditures. In the fossil world, it's different. It has lower capex and it has ongoing higher cost for exploration. So actually what would, would, ha would be needed is a significant increase in investments in the global energy system and we have only seen a plateau and that is because of two reasons investments in fossil fuels are coming down that is wanted by society but also by investors but the investments in renewables have not picked up significantly and that is not only a european problem it's a global problem so we are in an energy crisis despite the current uh, war in ukraine let me ask you about the chemical industry i mean teresa just said well i mean we hear a lot of talk some of them are empty promises. Um, do you see the chemical industry as a whole, not only Covestro, but your industry globally, really investing enough, doing enough, and doing it fast enough? Well, it's always a challenge to say, is it enough? Because no matter how deep you look at this, there's always an opportunity to do more. You know, there's hardly anything you do in life where you couldn't say, well, do more, do more, do more. But I also would like to look a little bit on what has happened so far. And I think there's nothing better than a practical example. If you look at Covestro, for example, uh, we have just decided already many years ago that we go for renewable electri uh, le electrical energy and that renewable electrical energy is currently already being built. For example, by 2025, we will have a contract with Ørsted, sorry for that, Marcus, uh, with Ørsted delivering then 10% uh, of our electrical energy that we need at our German plants. In Belgium, once again, sorry, Marcus, we have a contract with Engie, 45% uh, of renewable energy uh, is there to supply, our, uh, to supply our electrification needs at that uh, site. In China, we have uh, solar, for example, which is already now supplying 10% um, of the electricity demand with renewable energy. Small numbers on the one hand, on the other hand, putting it into perspective. Mm -hmm. One German site that we are operating consumes as much energy as a large German city. So put these things into perspective. That is also the reason why we need much more renewables and why we need it particularly for the chemical industry because that is where we consume most of the energy in Germany, in particular in the chemical industry, the steel industry, the cement industry. And if we have the opportunity at comparably low investment costs, if you look at other sectors, to invest there, make this industry green, then we have already leaped a significant step forward. And that's why I believe, yes, we can do more. We need much faster and much more renewable energy. And at the same time, we will therefore solve it where it is the cheapest to solve it. Mm -hmm. Because in the, let's say, mobility sector, it is much more costly to solve the topic. And that's why it is important that we solve it where we need least money to get most out of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's important. So the impact really is in the energy sector a lot. It concerns a lot of industries. We have another question from Mercedes Alonso from Neste. You also saw it in the film, so let's take that one too. My question to you is, how do you see this current European gas and energy crisis more as an opportunity or as a threat to our change towards a fossil-free future? And Marcus, you briefly touched on that already. I mean, we now have this crisis for your industry, for your company. Is that also an opportunity? Crisis can always be an opportunity, right? I think we need to distinguish two time horizons. I mean, short term, it's clearly the, the focus is now on security of supply 
and affordability, so price levels. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the typical triangle is, in addition, sustainability. Sustainability, reliability, and, and affordability. But currently, the focus is because we have a physical supply crunch. We don't have enough electricity. We don't have enough gas in Europe. The clear focus is on prices and, and availability. Um, and of course, we need to get out of it as fast as possible. I think all European countries are doing the right things. Um, I mean, the necessary investment into the gas infrastructure to become independent from Russian gas flows, LNG terminals, but also upgrading the pipeline system within Europe, uh, diversifying gas supply. And on the power side, we have additional stress because of the nuclear situation in France, where half of the generation capacity is not, um, is not in the system. And because of that, we need to keep all our plans and be it also those we actually wanted to decommission already, be it coal, be it lignite, be it nuclear, we need to keep them in the system for the next uh, years to get through this short-term crisis. And now turning to the long-term question, and here is exactly the opportunity, because we need significant investment, and if we, if we invest wisely in the modern technologies, we can solve both crises at the same time, the climate crisis as well as uh, the energy crisis, because we need to invest in sustainable technologies. Mm -hmm. What is important here when we look back, what, what went wrong, um, especially here in our home country, Germany, it is easier to discuss to close a dirty factory than what to do to support investments into the new technology. So we got it the wrong way because we have closure dates for everything but we are not fast enough with the investments in the new technologies. It should be the other way around. You shouldn't care about the old stuff. If the new stuff is there, it will phase out the old by itself. Um, and that needs to be changed from now on. Sophie, let me bring you into the discussion. Um, sorry you had to wait for so long. Uh, now, Systemic just published the uh, Planet Positive Chemicals Report. Uh, the report explores how uh, the chemical industry could basically reinvent itself. I mean, we've seen the pandemic has accelerated digitization for many industries. Now maybe this energy crisis can also accelerate um, transitions, transformations in certain industries. Um, so. What is your perspective? How does the industry really, where do they stand today? Uh, Marcus said, well, yes, I mean, you can never do enough, but is it really enough? How critical is it? How critical is the speed of the transition? Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, I do think we do in this report uh, uh, that you're referring to the uh, planet positive chemicals, we do want to uh, show solutions. That's very much the, the goal. But um, I do think your question is very important because before thinking about the solutions, we also need to acknowledge the urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the question of where do we stand today is absolutely crucial. Um, we are looking at an industry that uh, uh, is basically completely based on fossil. Yeah? It's when it comes to the feedstock. It's when it comes to the process energy. Uh, and it is not able to manage the end of life of the products uh, because of the value chain, because of the way that we uh, handle uh, uh, products in a, uh, in a linear way today. And it's a huge industry. It's an almost five trillion in industry. It's uh, f uh, responsible for 4% of our GDP and at the same time for 4% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a huge emission factor. Uh, all the downstream industries rely on it. It's in basically all manufactured goods. We show there it's 96% of manufactured goods. So all the other industries will not be able to decarbonize unless the chemical industry decarbonizes. And we're only talking about carbon here. I do think also at EU level we have a huge discussion about other impacts, uh, microplastics, pollution, um, and yeah, FMCGs are, uh, are getting under pressure uh, uh, for those as well. So it's not just the, the carbon story. So I do think it's very important to acknowledge the size of the challenge and thereby also the size of investments that are, that are needed and that we have been um, discussing. But yeah, I think we'll go in that more. Yeah. But what I do want to say is that uh, uh, with regard to the solution, yeah, I think uh, uh, the plastics industry, it's been in this century really uh, uh, a symbol of modernity. So it's been basically the basis for everything we see around here for you know, a lot of uh, civilizationatory uh, um, improvements that we've had. Mm -hmm. And we think it can play this role again. We think right now it's a laggard industry, 
but it can play this role again of standing for modernity by really uh, uh, showing the path into circularity. And also, uh, we believe it cannot only be uh, carbon neutral, we believe it can be a carbon sink in 2050. So we can actually help to get carbon out of the air and contributing to uh, uh, really lowering our problem, not just stabilizing the problem that we have today. So we all agree we cannot do business as usual. We have to change. Yes, we agree on this urgency. Um, let, me, let me ask about the how. I mean, how can an industry this big and this important to all of us really transform and do that with the speed that it needs. Um, you talk about decarbonization. I mean, it sounds a little ironic because you're uh, sort of depending on the sea, on the carbon. Um, Sophie, maybe you can also share your perspective a little bit. What's, what are the key factors for this transformation? I want to dive a little bit deeper into this, into this how. What are the key factors for this industry specifically to transform? Yeah. Look. I think we talked today about circularity, and circularity is very much about uh, uh, the connection of the value chain and of the, of the acting together. So on the one hand, uh, we need to decarbonize or manage the carbon, I should say, on the chemical industry side. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the whole uh, uh, decarbonization path there that needs to be followed again on the feedstock, on the input energy. But there's also the path of the downstream uh, uh, industries uh, all the way to the consumer to really acknowledge and uh, 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 demand for, for products that are recyclable, reusable, and so closing uh, the use of chemicals within the uh, um, value chain. But also, um, we actually have an opportunity to fundamentally um, reduce the, the raw material demand that we have today. And this will be very key because it's the cheapest way. We see that by going circular, we can reduce one third of all the investments that are needed. So again, I think that divestment topic that we had, it's the safest way because today we rely on a lot of uh, uh, technologies that are still nascent. So will we be able to scale them fast enough? That's a, a big issue. And it's the greenest way. We avoid a lot of the impacts that I talked about, like microplastic, like pollution. So to really have that systemic view, that's what needs to happen in order to, to, to solve the issue that we have. Marcus, do you agree? I mean, how, how can a decarbonization or a reduction uh, of raw materials, uh, defossilization, happen for the chemical industry? I think uh, defossilization, that's the right term. And we are very technical people, so we love to really talk about uh -huh. all this. Uh, you know, and then some people scratch in their head and saying, what the heck are they talking about? And also here, maybe a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, I would go that far that I think we need more plastics. And why do I believe so? Um, there's numerous reasons, but one of the two key arguments for me are, number one, we have a significant resource crisis looming. And we have a lot of materials that are not being able to be replenished in very short periods of time. Carbon is one of the only and one of the very few materials that can be recycled more or less every 12 months because that is what Mother Nature does. So we have plenty of carbon available supported by Mother Nature. That means if we use Mother Nature, and I'm not talking about gas or other fossils or oil, that's why defossilization, we need to shift our feedstock in the industry completely to renewable sources of carbon. Some people refer to it as green carbon. That's what we need to do. That could be waste, that could be carbon dioxide, uh, that could be plant, and here I'm talking about second generation biomass. That means things that are not used for the food chain. And then the second step is, that we defossilize the industry by switching to renewable energy. And here we have a massive task ahead of us because today a lot of energy that the chemical industry is using is not only electrical energy, but is chemical energy that is in gas, for example, for heating to produce steam, which is the energy carrier. So if you look into more depth into it, it is all about defossilization. It is about getting massive amounts of energy and to just put this into perspective, due to a recent study from the year 2019 by Acatec, 
uh, we found that we need the same amount of electrical energy for the chemical industry by 2050 that we today use for the entire population in Germany. That means the entire electrical demand will go only into the chemical industry. So long story short, I believe, given the wonderful opportunity that Mother Nature is helping us to recycle carbon and that we can fully go for renewable energy for the chemical industry, that we will be happy in the future that we even have more plastics available because it helps us to avoid the use of other materials that are not so easily replenishable and cannot so easily be recycled. And that is what I also see as an outlook where we have to have a more open debate in society about why plastics are needed and why we maybe even need more of it. It helps to preserve food, it's about medical support, it's about, let's say, a mobility um, change, it is about different lives in cities that are maybe even carbon negative and so on and so forth. So it seems we agree on a lot of things. I mean, we want to get rid of the fossil feedstock, yes, but when I you know, look at the value chain, we have a lot of independencies. I mean, you just mentioned, well, you're depending on the energy industry. So, Marcus, I mean, what are the bottlenecks for you um, when it comes to really making that 100% that, that transition to renewables, not only for your company, but for the industry as a whole? So I think it's a, it's a question of, um, I would call it a, a chain of de-bottlenecking, right? <laughs> because we all, would have, we all wished we would have more offshore wind, more solar panels, more onshore wind, more, uh, maybe even further ahead in the hydrogen economy. Um, so I can clearly tell you money is not the problem. I mean, you always find uh, sources of investments to invest in green energy. So what are the problems? And that is currently highly, uh, hot, hotly debated. One is, of course, uh, planning and permitting. It takes in Europe sometimes seven to eight years before you have clarity whether you are allowed to build, build a project or not. I have full sympathy that there are conflicting interests and residents say we don't want it here, we don't want it this way. That is all acceptable. But we need to take a decision faster, because otherwise you frustrate investors and you don't employ the resources here. You put them somewhere else where you have the decision faster. I think politicians are working on th that. It's, it's, um, it is going in the right direction. Hopefully we see the first positive developments within the typical lead times of 24 months. But I'm optimistic. Um, second question is, we have an inherent conflict between um, the target to, to, to fight climate change and to protect individual species, um, be it for offshore wind, but also for onshore wind. So, of course, it is technology which sometimes is harmful for individual animals. And that conflict needs to be resolved. Um, do we want to protect every individual animal, or do we want to protect the species? Um, that is something where I don't have an opinion, <coughs> but it needs to be discussed, because otherwise we're never going to have clarity where we can build an onshore or offshore wind farm. And the third, uh, third uh, de-bottlenecking we need is um, the entire value chain. If you look at um, the current production capacity for solar panels in Europe, outside China, Southeast Asia, the production capacity of offshore wind turbines, and you know that not only needs to double, we probably need to tenfold it, mm -hmm. and then you work your way back along the entire value chain. Where do you source the lithium? Where do you source the nickel? Where do you source the cobalt? And so on. Um, that needs a master plan, a European master plan. And I think, unfortunately, um, our friends in America are a bit advanced because they have a very stable investment framework now. Um, they have a clear strategy to bring production capacity back. And I think we need to have something similar here because otherwise we are all very happy that we have de-bottleneck planning and permitting, but then we find ourselves in three years' time without any production capacity for the technology we need. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I made my head on that. I was heavily criticized for making a statement a couple of weeks ago about the amount of steel that you need for a wind turbine. Uh, the fundamental, let's say, um, essence and key message was we are too slow in building wind turbine energy. Take the German Energy Agency, uh, take, for example, um, the Association of Wind Producers in Germany. They have very clear numbers. They say if we want to meet the 600 terawatt hours as a target for renewable electricity in Germany by 2030, they said we need every day 
six, let's say, onshore wind turbines uh, every working day, six onshore turbines, and at least one offshore turbine. Think about it. That is seven, seven a day. Mm -hmm. And that is much more than we're currently building. And Marcus had exactly alluded, let's say, to all the things that need to work, let's say, like a clockwork and very precise to get to that. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I would love that we jointly really stick our heads together and say, okay, how do we get there? What is all needed? Exactly the master plan that, that Marcus was referring to is needed more than ever. Because otherwise, we will fall short of the high ambitions. Ambitions are great. It's really great, but this is now this time about doing it and not talking about it that we intend to do it. And when we see that we're maybe not getting there, saying, well, then we need to just increase the target. Mm -hmm. No, we need to increase that we're getting those things in the ground, on the ground, and making it all reliable. And we have not even talked about storing, storage capacity, and we have not even talked about uh, the grids that we need to build for it. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that's why I say let's focus on getting it done. Mm -hmm. Look, so I would yeah. love to. <laughs> sorry, uh, is, 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 sorry, Sophie, uh, because I've seen Teresa uh, <laughs> <laughs> getting more wanting more to, on my to comment on that. And, and you know, yeah. it always, in these discussions, sometimes it seems like you know, the, the industries, are, they're very, you know, uh, they're agreeing that they could do so much if only regulation yeah. would allow them to do it. So <laughs> yeah, I, I see Please a big comment. discrepancy here, if I can say. I found it really interesting what you said about saying investment is not the problem, um, wh which I hear, and then I hear, you know, there's, there's markets, but what we see is it's the opposite. It's not advancing fast enough, right? We have carbon, uh, carbon neutrality targets, 2050, 2060, maybe 2040. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's really not we enough. We have 2035, <laughs> just to mention. <laughs> well, also not enough. I have to disappoint so, but you. But then As where the is the renewable IPCC. energy? That's what we need, Teresa. Yeah, we need yeah, I, I renewable know, energy. I know. We need to build it. I know. That's what I'm talking about. And Marcus has made it very clear where the bottleneck is. Money is not the issue. The willingness to invest is not the yes. issue. When we go out today and want to buy renewable energy, we are getting no offer that is fast enough to really serve our ambitious goals. We can't build ourselves because we don't get the permits fast enough, we don't get the material, and we cannot even buy it mm. yeah, because everyone else is facing a similar challenge. And Marcus has clearly eluded where the challenges Maybe, are. Yeah. We need to get rid of the conflict in targets. So and what I think the most relevant part is here, yes, that might be one thing for renewable energy, but actually looking at uh, and working in research projects and supply chain transparency, I see the opposite is the case. We hear companies saying we cannot move because of the other, the competitors, we can't invest right now because if we invest now, then we are more expensive and so on and so forth. Asking for more clarity from, from regulators. We have the EU framework directive from like last decade. We have the Green Deal and so on. What else is needed for industry to move? We need that, that step. We so can't we start waiting for How do, for how do we other. get there? Do we need regulation that forces the industries to actually do that? Or what is the key? I, I would love to. Yes, say Sophie. About please. That. Because I love to, to think, uh, as you say, Marcus, that we are at a moment where there is you know, a consensus and acknowledgement about the um, investment needed. I do want to also provoke a bit at, you know, agree with something that, that you said. Uh, I think we have not invested enough in the past. Uh, and I love to think that this is the wake up moment and that now we will do it, right? Uh, I think, you know, we are here or you're here as a youth representative. Uh, uh, we always talk about youth. I think back of the moment, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, I was working uh, in the German parliament and we were actually discussing the dependency of Russian gas. And we were discussing, you know, the need to uh, make the energy transition. This is over 20 years ago. And there would have been a chance to invest a lot more than we have done. And yes, the regulation. You is know what I did? That's well. why I studied chemistry. And that's why I went into the chemical industry to exactly change that. And that's why I'm sitting here and asking now, let's get it done. It doesn't help us to always look back. That's a typical German, German disease to always look back and trying to say, you know what? He did that wrong. She did that wrong. That was too slow. That didn't work out. This time is over. We need to look forward. We need to create a future. And we need to create a positive momentum because we need to rally society behind this idea. We need to explain where will be the shortfalls, where will also be, let's say, the, 
yeah, negativities that are associated with, with regard to different consumption patterns. And particularly, we need to make customers love buying the stuff that we are investing in. And that's where we need to start. Instead, we're starting once again from the end and saying, oh, industry needs to be regulated. No. Consumers need to be motivated. They need to be on fire to buy those products. That's what we need to redirect our energy to. We are standing here. We are sitting here. We are ready. But that's not that where, where the problem lies if you look at supply chains. I mean, right now, most suppliers still say that they cannot sell products if they're more expensive than their competitors because it's very intransparent. It's not clear right now on how to move towards that transparency to really show it to the final customer. And same thing for customers as well. I mean, it's very hard right now to find out which of the products at hand is actually more sustainable because there's no way to find that out at this moment. And there is no positive way to really incentivize companies in there because we don't see that investment that, that you mentioned, maybe in renewable energy. I'm, I'm not an expert in renewable energy. I'm more on supply chains. So um, that investment is not something we see when it comes to making supply chains more transparent and resilient and really encouraging sustainability there. It's still the cheapest product, the cheapest component that rules. Mm -hmm. Marcus? I, I give you two very practical examples. I mean, RWE is very well known as a German company, but Germany is only around 20, 25 percent of our business. So it's a, it's a global business, and I see how the different investments in renewable energy goes in other European countries, in the US, and other places. So our approach in Europe is highly conceptual, very complicated, and discretionary. So. What do we do with building the hydrogen economy, which is also very much needed for your business, Marcus? <coughs> so our approach is, if you want to build a hydrogen project, you're going to fill out these forms. Then you send them to Brussels. And there sits somebody and says, OK, I like this project. I don't like this one. This I need to reconsider, and so on. And then you one day get through this, what they call the IPSE project process. And you get the necessary funding for the project, because some kind of funding is needed, because it's an early technology in the early days. That is our approach. It takes ages. We are now waiting two years to get to build the largest electrolyzer in Europe, because the decision is not being taken. The American approach is different. One kilogram of green hydrogen is good. Whoever produces it in whatever way, I don't care. I exactly support one kilogram of green hydrogen. Clarity, simplicity, pragmatism, and we go for it. And we're going to see that we're going to build, a, we, were at, we were much advanced compared to our colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic in that business, but they will overtake us within two years. Other example is um, you want to build a an, 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 an wind farm. Um, you go and say, okay, I, I get, take my teams to Germany or I take my teams to parts of the United States. In the United States, you apply for one, you go, somebody takes it to the court, you get a decision within 12 months, and you know after 18 months whether you can start with the groundwork. Here, the same process takes eight years, because it goes to the, f to the first court layer, second court layer, third court layer, and so on. It is <coughs> too slow. And, even, and, the, and money is not the problem, and so far is also the availability of technology not the problem. But the problem is you don't have clarity, and that frustrates investors. Um, and uh, you need to make a very much more investment-friendly environment, because right. money will go where it can invest. Right. And we are willing to do every project in Germany because it's highly profitable, I mean, because of the scarcity of supply. But we cannot move fast enough. So, and these are problems we cannot solve ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot give me seabed leases. <laughs> I don't own seabed, so I, I, can only, I can only build offshore wind farms when I get the seabed. And as a German company, and number two in offshore, and the largest one in Germany, we are currently building the only project under construction in Germany. But at the same time, our projects in Denmark, in the UK, in U the US, are bigger than the ones in Germany. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Marcus. I mean, let me find out, you, you're on your path, um, you have your goal, you want the circular economy for Covestor, for the industry, basically. Who's stepping on the brakes? Is it, is it regulation? Is it that things take too long? Uh, Marcus said, well, money is not the issue here. You nodded, yes, okay, we potentially would have the investments. Um, but still, Teresa said, well, it's not going fast enough. Who's, who's on the brakes? 
Well, there's a couple of things where people standing on the brakes, but it is also once again a big, big challenge because I do not want to start a blame game. I can just say what is currently happening, and Marcus has brought a couple of practical examples. It's not the willingness uh, lacking to invest. It is just once you take the internal decision to invest, then you have to really convince and involve so many stakeholders who all want to have a fair share that overall the process is too slow. And in practical terms, it's not that I say um, I blame someone, it is just practical experience that things are way too slow and that we have other examples, other countries where things are simply moving faster. And one word here is pragmatism. And one word is also having a reasonable appetite to take also some risks in that context. And once again, transparency on supply chain, yes. However, we cannot start because we're still thinking about the transparency of supply chain and that will take another, I would say, at least half a decade until we come to reasonable regulation in that context, whereas other countries have moved forward. Why have they moved forward? Because they start convincing consumers about buying different stuff and consumers make choices. And we have numerous examples where we now have, for good or for bad reasons, change, for example, in the packaging industry from one material to the other, and consumers love it. They really love it. However, unfortunately, we have given them choices which are less environmentally friendly. However, why has that happened? Because regulation is currently not there, so people just move forward and move in a specific direction. However, it shows that you can convince consumers if you put in the right marketing tools, if you explain the story nicely, to change their behavior. So what we need, therefore, is less regulation, and I mean much less regulation. And at the same time, we need smarter regulation, so really setting frameworks in that context. And a good example in the past was, like it or not, uh, the European, uh, European emission trading system. For example, that was a good path. You know, you had clarity by when will you have how many emission rights and by what time they will be seized and by what time you have to take which measures. And then you could go your own path forward to deal with situ that situation. And that was a framework conditions. And we need more of those framework conditions and less of that nitty gritty detailed explanation and particular involvement of, let's say, even more bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. What one on the other hand need is we not need more people in the public administration who understand the stuff uh, that they need to deal with, because that would also help us to get speed up, even under the current frameworks, the respective investment decisions. And let me be absolutely clear, the industry knows where its fair share is, and the industry is ready, and we now need to make sure that we jointly move forward. And that's why I think also the debate needs to move away from tell me whom to blame, rather, with whom to sit together and now craft the plan to really move forward. That's what we need. It, it still seems that, you know, asking for the right frameworks uh, it seems a little bit like an old tale, Teresa. I mean, here with Circularize, um, you know, we have two of the the big players, the tankers uh, here on stage, old industries, the energy industry, the chemical industry. Um, and, and Marcus just mentioned an, an, an interesting aspect, uh, the risk taking, you know. Are they willing to take the risk? Um, we see a lot of startups, a vibrant startup scene, especially in the sustainability field. They're risk takers, they do something. They're, they're, some of them evolve to become game changers, actually, you know. So, some of them disrupting industries. Um, is that something that we need, something that can sort of wake up some of the old tankers and push them a little bit? So sounds like a good idea. No, I think it, it, what, you're in, what you're mentioning is, is correct. It, it's the same investments that were mentioned earlier. It is also something we see in the startup world. That there are especially also VCs looking more into um, more sustainable products and sustainable companies to, to fund them. Um, the problem is is really the the looking left and right for for my competitors. Uh, when am when are they moving? When am I moving? Can I move? Mm -hmm. that, that we hear on, on a daily basis because it is not possible right now for people that are not um, maybe the OEM to to really prove how sustainable they are, they are and. Um, 
what is actually in their in their product and therefore of course for for their customers it's hard to to justify buying the products if they're not more more sustainable and it's not clearly traceable where where does my material come from and that goes back to the consumer there's actually interesting research from Deloitte from 2014 that customers are willing to pay up to 15 percent more for the same product if it's certified and and sustainable that's something that we see so we need that we need to close that because right now even I don't know in some cases when I hold two products in the supermarket which is now better, which has traveled how far. Mm -hmm. And that is something where we need more transparency. And that will also benefit us in the difficulties we will have in resilience. Because we have things like a war, things like COVID. Those things are not going to go away. We will have more of that with climate change. So we need that resilience, even for companies' interests. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie, let me, let me get a little bit back to the, the bigger picture. I mean, uh, we see many industries Yes, they talk about sustainability, some of them even talk about circular economy, but closing that loop is still you know, far away. And it's, it's, it's an enormous um, thing to, to actually achieve, to make a reality, especially when you have uh, a very long value chain. Um, so is circular really the way to go? And then how can we, how can we scale it you know, globally? Isn't um, scalability also an important factor in all this? Yes, absolutely. Is it the way to go? Yes, I would definitely say, uh, say yes, it is. Um, one, uh, I think we think a lot uh, uh, about recycling when we talk about uh, circularity, and it is uh, a fundamental building block. Mm -hmm. But I think before that, we also see that there is still a lot of slack in the system. Um, there is a lot of inefficient use of resources, uh, and we know a lot of these uh, uh, examples. Uh, so, you know, plastics uh, ending up in the seas or anywhere in the environment, this is a loss uh, of a resource. Uh, nitrogen that is uh, flowing off and it's not being used or taken up by plants, this is all a loss uh, of resources. Cars standing on the streets 95% of the time. So these are all examples of a lot of uh, a slack in the system that we can address in addition to, uh, to the topic of, of uh, uh, recycling. And uh, um, again, it makes sense. I've mentioned it before. Uh, uh, it uh, uh, saves us a lot of uh, uh, cost uh, in the system. And uh, this is really uh, uh, not a small amount. Uh, um, again, we calculated about one third less uh, of investment need. And that is a huge amount given the huge investments uh, that are needed that we have uh, uh, discussed. So uh, how to scale? Uh, I also would like to get back to a point that you were saying, the, the uh, you know, discussion within the, within the value chain. It does cost money. It does cost money, and this money needs to be uh, paid by someone, uh, very often the end consumer. But if uh, uh, well distributed within the value chain, we've also calculated that this is just 1% to 3% of the, uh, of the total cost. Earlier, when we were discussing, you were talking about the, the, the shoe that costs 6 euros more from 200 to 206. So I think what is needed is really coming together in the value chain, having this discussion, and making a better product offer. Because I agree with you, the, the consumer plays a role, but the consumer is confused. It's very confusing today to understand which one should I choose. So there needs to be this offer. And in order to have the offer, you need the value chain collaboration. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's a very important aspect. Because I mean, after all, yes, we're, we want to uh, really enforce that collaboration. We want to craft the connections. and. Uh, I just want to come back to your report, which, by the way, is really uh, <laughs> worth reading. Um, you advocate for establishing a first movers coalition. So is that the way to go to really bring the right people together to collaborate, to really connect and get going? Because I guess we all agree no one can do it alone. Yes. I think no one can do it alone is in there. Then, uh, uh, again, it costs money. I think the ones that move, uh, move first, they do have to, to bear the cost. Uh, so the first mover coalition that, that uh, uh, we are advocating in this report, it's really bringing together the whole value chain from the supply to the demand and saying, OK, which ones are the products in which we can have the green carbon, in which we will have a fully defossilized system from the energy input to the, to the green carbon that is being used, and which are the products that will be bought uh, uh, on the demand side, and where is this going into, so that we can start scaling and making the investments in the right place. I think this also has to do with the plan that you were uh, uh, mentioning in terms of 
where do we start and how do we get to the scale that we really need until 2040, 2050? So, Marcus, let's, let's start crafting connections. Um, look at the panel. Um, where can you start? Where can you start connecting with these people to really uh, achieve what you want to do? And I mean, you said, yeah, well, you, have, you don't have any current contracts with uh, RWE, but still, I mean, we're here, we're talking. Um, so where does it start for you? Well, I don't know where to start because the list is so long already, <laughs> but let's say in terms of immediate impact, it's definitely about renewable energy. And that's why Marcus and I uh, are uh, basically talking, at least our teams are talking on a very frequent basis, what can we do so that we can collaborate on renewable energy? And by the way, benefits on both sides because we have also due to the innovative character of this so-called old industry, developed a material that reduces significantly the production time for wind turbine blades, makes them longer lasting, therefore reduces maintenance cost. And that is particularly for offshore wind turbine blades, a massive advantage in terms of the total cost and therefore the total cost to produce, uh, let's say renewable energy, making it even more competitive than it already is. So that's the first thing, first contact. Secondly, the supply chain issue. So how, how can we make consumers taking the right decisions. So knowing what they're buying, yeah, scanning a QR code, whatever, getting information about that's the right product, that product has this impact in terms of travel time, supply chains, resources, replenishment, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, looking at the true systemic approach, and I mean it uh, intentionally in the double meaning, uh, to say, what are the main levers that we have to make this industry circular? And there is, as I said, next to bio-based raw materials, uh, we need to start very early at consumers' behavior, particularly resource efficiency of the goods in use. And you're absolutely right. Why do we have cars standing around 90 to 95 percent of the time? Because that 95 percent of unusage of a car drives resource consumption, drives energy consumption, uh, drives, let's say, recycling issues, drives additional investments. And that's what I mean, not consuming and continue to consume as we did might be a huge part of the challenge and a huge part, let's say, to solve mm -hmm. uh, the issues we are talking about. Because the best energy is the energy that we don't need. And that's why we need to think about particular little examples that, that uh, Sophie and Teresa have brought. And that's why I have a long list of issues and topics that we can jointly discuss. And yes, I'm by nature always part of the first mover coalition. Very good. So, I'll, yeah, in, in just a second, because uh, Therese, I want to get your perspective on that. Um, when it comes to crafting connections, where we see a lot of conflicts these days, especially with the younger generation, uh, climate activists. Um, how important is it from your perspective to really connect on a political level with these industries? Uh, how can these industries connect better with UNEP, for example? Uh, I think it's extremely relevant to, to connect. Um, I think one of the biggest problems about the frustrations that we see right now is because young people feel powerless with that situation. Because if you look around, I mean, at this conference, we're the top 3% of the world if you look at the economic situation. And we are making decisions that are impacting young people all over the world. And it's extremely important to make sure that young people are actually involved in those decision-making processes and can engage in that, that are actually able to make the decisions. Because of course, those are the ones that are going to feel the impacts. Mm -hmm. And I think that does make a different thing. Of course, we can't look back, we can't change the past. But I think that's a structural change we can make right now to see how can we um, make that happen. Actually, in the UN, in some cases, it's already happening. Young people can, in the UN, sit at the table and negotiate, well, not negotiate, but speak to the member states in the plenary. And I think that's something we need everywhere, those kind of possibilities to bring in young people, in, in boards, in advisory boards, in everywhere to make sure we have the people at the table that feel that impact most. And um, yeah, collaboration across all different types of, of stakeholders, I think, is, is, is very relevant um, as well. And I mean, the investment point, I think it was a very, sorry, I'm always pointing to you for the investment. Uh, but for the investment point, I think a very important point to mention is, yes, we might, there might be enough investment for renewable energy at this moment right now. Yes, but maybe we are looking at, I guess, big companies. We are looking at, um, at Europe, I, I assume. Um, what we see is um, 
startups, small companies, young people building sustainable businesses in communities in the global south that have zero possibilities to get support. There are no startup incubators as I know them. There are no possibilities for, for companies or organizations to build up such sustainable structures, even if it's you know negotiating tables on how can we interact with business and so on. That's lacking. And I think as a big stakeholders, especially from Europe, we have a responsibility there to support. Mm -hmm. So before we open it up to the audience, um, let me just uh, ask a last question and ask all of you to, to share your perspective. Um, I'll start with you, Marcus. Now, let's look into the future. We'll, on this stage, uh, for the next seven days, we want to really focus on solutions. So what do you see, um, what's, what's your outlook for the future? What do you see as key positive developments happening right now in your industry? In our industry, I think, as I said in the beginning, and that's maybe closing the circle, uh, we have a huge opportunity now because it is so obvious to everybody that we need to invest in the energy system. And it's totally clear that we need to smartly invest so in new technologies. And there's an openness for everybody to discuss now what needs to happen that we, what I said, de-bottleneck it, mm -hmm. that we really have the plan uh, to invest. And I just want to come back to another point, I mean, to closing also the circle here. What is interesting for our industry, we provide renewable energy, but we are only at the beginning to think about, is that actually sustainable? I mean, are we talking about green steel? Are we talking about recyclable blades? Because the landfill of the blades, when you don't need them anymore, is a huge problem. Well, we will, so, we will be talking about recyclable blades on this stage. So <laughs> you don't want? We will be talking later, about Later, yes. yes. And I mean, we are currently installing with our uh, partners from Siemens Gameda the first one globally in, in, in our German offshore wind farm. Um, and that is actually, I mean, what is important, because you can only talk about sustainable green energy when the entire production process, including the technology, is actually green. And there we are also at the beginning now. All right, Teresa, what are key developments that give you hope? Wow. Um, <laughs> key developments that give me hope is international collaboration, that we work together with people that I literally sit a zo in a Zoom room with 400 people from all over the world at all times, that we can learn about things fast, that we have the possibilities to find out what's happening in Iran, what's happening in, for example, small uh, startups in, in the South or in any part. Um, that gives me hope. And um, yeah, I think that's the most relevant. Sophie, what do you think? Well, one thing that gives me hope is when I hear that you know there is a, a, a discussion about a new value proposition uh, uh, within the value chain. Yeah, that the the players in a very complex value chain start discussing and agreeing what is uh, uh, you know new design that makes products more recyclable. What is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, things that uh, allow us to to use less but for the right uses, uh, allow us to to reuse and so on to really come together and discuss, uh, 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 discuss this new value proposition. That's what, what gives me hope. All right, thank you. Marcus. Well, what gives me hope is that we're sitting here, that we have this very diverse, I would say, panel here uh, from, from the perspective we're discussing, because that's the only thing, as I said, collaboration that really brings us forward to understand different perspectives and then saying, OK, based on all we have put on the table, what are the right priorities? What will have the best impact, the highest impact at the lowest resource needs? And that gives me hope. The second thing that gives me hope that we have a young generation which is now actively, since years, in involving um, it itself in the process and getting impact. The third topic is, which I would love to see more of, is that also we have more people going into science, technology, engineering, math, informatics as an education, because these are the things that we predominantly need to solve all those issues. So I would really encourage also young people to go into these levels of education, these fields of education, because that guarantees you a sit seat at the table, not only to discuss, but maybe to lead those corporations, maybe to lead those industries, and therefore pushing this process even further. All right, thank you so much. So we agree that there's an urgency to change. We agree we need that transition towards the circular economy and climate neutrality. We may not all agree on the exact steps that we need to take or who needs to take them, but what we do need to do is come together, collaborate, craft the connections, and that's why we have you. Um, we want to connect with you now. 
take your questions. We have microphones, they'll come to you, so please just raise your hand and we can take your question. So, who has a question to the panel? We're looking for the we're, icebreaker. Yes, we're looking for the icebreaker. <laughs> um, we also, also have a tablet here that will take me to our uh, digital channels, and let's see if we have any questions from our digital audience. If the network is still working, yes, it seems it is. So anyone, any questions? Yes, in front. Yeah. What do you do um, to stop that with talking and finally begin working? What do you do about that? So let me repeat the question. So w what do you want to do to you know, really um, start get going and stop the talking and start doing? I don't know, anyone? To whom? Yeah. anyone? So I, I can start. I mean, when you look at our company, we have uh, just on last end of last year announced a 50 billion investment program until 2030 in renewable energy, um, storage facilities, um, and also the hydrogen economy. Um, here in Germany, where you know that we still operate um, coal plants, we have last week announced with the government, and that's maybe counterintuitive in a crisis, to um, end uh, coal-fired power generation by 2030 instead of 2038. And that is, I mean, an, an, an active measure to actually enforce that the modernization which needs to happen happens now because we put the government and us now under pressure to exactly replace what we're going to close by 2030 by new technology. Um, and I think we are taking action <laughs> everywhere. Um, I'm actually also, maybe it sounded a bit pessimistic. When I look at the global picture, I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to fight climate change. Where I have my doubts whether we are fast enough, when I think now about our home country, Europe and Germany, what is our piece of that? And when can we keep our current competitive position or are we going to lose because we are not pragmatic enough? So globally, I'm actually optimistic. The question in the end is, how will the cake be shared regionally? Yeah, and if I continue, uh, let's say, on that path and on that journey, um, just to give you an example on the renewable materials, uh, we have now for all large products that we're bringing into the market an alternative product there under the CQ brand, which we can offer from today onwards to our customers, and we're introducing those products here at the booth which are from cradle to our gates, climate neutral, and are based on green carbon. So the alternatives are there. Consumers can start buying. It is no longer a concept. It is no longer just talking. It is really walking this concept, this visionary concept of a circular economy. No matter what you're talking about, you want to have something for your refrigerator foam, you want to have something for your building insulation, you want to have something for your car seats, you want to have something for your car interior, all green carbon, all climate neutral, by the way, fully certified. ISCC Plus certification, and you can really track and trace where does it come from, how is it processed, and how it does then really end up in your production as a customer. So that's the real step forward. It's no longer concepts. It is reality. You can buy it. And that's what I believe is also the reason why we have stepped up significantly our innovation efforts and why we're also using, meanwhile, digital technologies in research and development to not only craft those products, but even crafting them faster, also to, to give a perspective for Germany and for Europe that chemistry is still a highly innovative, innovation-driven industry, and it is not an old economy, and it is not an old industry. It is younger than ever. <laughs> All right. So, do you, do you guys want to comment well, on that? I'm happy to also comment on it. Uh, I'm not an industry player, obviously. Um, but I do work on forging uh, uh, collaboration uh, and coordination, and we desperately need that. That's where I would start. A lot of these investments in hydrogen, in renewable energy, they are needed by a bunch uh, of, of uh, uh, industries. And I think the, the, the plastics or chemical industry is a very important one of them. Coming together, understanding, you know, building hubs, uh, uh, doing investments together, making a demand and offtake agreements, right, that actually will make these investments uh, uh, viable. That's one. You also mentioned the regional aspects, uh, and that's also a big hope for me. I think 
we should do a lot here. We have a lot of uh, you know, resource insecurity and supply chain insecurity, and we should be very aware of that. But I do think there is also a great opportunity to, uh, to invest in the South. So we know that in Africa there are a number of places, Namibia, where uh, uh, there is a great hydrogen uh, potential. Um, and sometimes more than we, we have it here, right? It's, it's quite uh, costly here to, to produce. And I do think it's a great chance to also agree to make uh, some of these hubs in the south and to have uh, good trade agreements uh, uh, on that and also bringing more balance into the system that we have today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think two more points is, first of all, really assessing our goals. I mean, I always hear, you know, growth of the industry while becoming sustainable and circular and so on and so forth. That's probably not that easy. So just also seeing what kind of, what is the minimum that we can get to because uh, just, just growing but sustainably is just not gonna, gonna make it. And secondly, also a bit more transparency on um, where are we where are we moving with 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 policy for example we still know that there are actors that are trying to um, basically prevent uh, developments on legislation and um, especially when it comes to transparency or or shifts to renewables um, where i think it's important to really make transparent which kind of companies are actively working on it and deserve that kind of the, um, that kind of uh, yeah, basically view and where we where are still difficulties um, in the relations between also government and industries Thank you very much. Any more questions? Another, yes. Thank you very much. Um, in your entry statement, Mr. Stahlmann, you mentioned that the importance of making connection is uh, inevitable to have further success and uh, to make a probably specific question. The carbon to camp project, uh, where uh, Covesto is also involved, is probably one of the examples. And I'm aware that uh, last year, the second phase of this project uh, was initiated in order to scale up processes from carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide using. Can you probably elaborate on this a uh, little bit further, what the current status is, what the outlook is, because I think it goes until 2026, and this is just around the corner in terms of, let's say, investments. Well, first and foremost, thanks for that very detailed question. And you really uh, take uh, get me here off guards because I do not have the current status of that project. But I think in the aftermath of that, let's say, uh, let's say current uh, panel discussion, I'm happy to provide more details. However, what is for us really important, and I said that in an earlier context um, as well in a different context, we want to use renewable carbon sources as fast as possible and to the largest extent possible in line with the ability to commercialize it. Because we must not forget one thing, and I'm coming back to that, we need the consumers. We desperately need the consumers in terms of changed behavior, in terms of accepting that there will be different products out in the market, convenient products out in the market, and also products out there in the market that do not or lesser and lesser relying on fossil-based fuels. And today, we have somewhat, let's say, getting addicted to a lifestyle that is not, um, let's say, capable of living and adapting to the resource boundaries that we have on this planet. So it is all about take, make, waste. And therefore, Covestro, with many other partners, is engaging in such type of projects to understand how we can close the loops. And there is no Swiss army knife, uh, or not one single solution. We need a Swiss army knife for that, because there is hundreds of technologies out there. Some are niche technologies, some are very early stage technologies, some are very much developed, who are using carbon already today, who are using carbon capture technologies, who are using carbon uh, that comes from, let's say, other circles back into, uh, let's say, the production space. But it is very challenging these days to decide upfront which technology will make it. And that's why my general plea is always, let's set frameworks from a regulation perspective and not exclude, based on whatever types of analysis, some technologies too early. Because honestly speaking, that's how markets work. If a technology in a, diff in a given framework is not competitive, it will disappear. And yes, there will be also wrong investments, but that is normal, let's say, undertaking of entrepreneurs that you take investment decisions in a given framework. And the development that we currently see that we believe 
more re le regulation and even deeper and detailed regulation will fix it. The opposite, from my perspective, is the better way. Framework decisions that are smartly steering into a different direction and then let the market rule. And that will happen because we have smart marketeers in many consumer good companies, smart marketeers in many other industries. And that's why I also believe that over time, if we collaborate, if we understand end consumers' needs, then we will also be able to put the right technologies in place. And that's the way forward for me. And the carbon to chem a project is one of those projects from my perspective which we're currently trying whether it pays off or not whether it is a technology that is working or not but unfortunately i do not have the actual status on top of my head sorry for that but in the aftermath i'm happy to provide you with more information i would yes. like to uh, <laughs> Please. i cannot talk about this specific uh, uh, project but i think the topic you brought up it's very important because we believe that this is the fundamental opportunity for the chemical industry to reinvent itself um, so taking carbon from the air and then ideally uh, through carbon capture and storage, for example, putting it under the ground is completely reversing the, the system that we have today. And then I think, of course, and that's what we try to do in the report, right? We try to see how fast can we scale this through which technologies there will be still, especially in this area, a lot of development of, of technologies, but there are some things that we can know. It will be cheaper right now to take it from point source, for example, take it from other uh, uh, industries that are uh, uh, emitting the carbon, like cement and steel and so on, than taking it from the air today. But we need to drive these, these two ways, because hopefully these other industries will also uh, decarbonize themselves. So therefore, we need the, the technology development. But we can start making a roadmap on that, and that's what we've been uh, trying to do. All right. Thank you very much for the question. Any other questions? In the audience, anyone? <laughs> Looking at my tablet here. So it seems we don't have any further questions from our online uh, community. So at this point, uh, it's 12 noon. I just want to close it by saying, well, we agreed on so many things. We agreed, disagreed on a few others. But the importance is talking about it, coming together, and then if we bring different industries, businesses, politics, us as consumers, we're all consumers in this room. Together, we can together close the loop and become fully circular, hopefully, not only the chemical and plastics industry, but um, in general, all of humanity. And I'll close the loop for this panel discussion. Thank you for coming, for taking the time, being here. Thank you for coming. And of course, we'll continue this discussion on this stage. So if you want to spend the rest of the day here at K2022 or the rest of the week even, we're more than happy to have you, invite you to come to the arena. And I ha hope you have a great day here in Dusseldorf. Thank you once again, and goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.